Ladies and gentlemen, can dogs do math? <laughs> It's not as silly a question as it first sounds. Somehow, when I bounce the ball, my, my dog knows where to be to catch it. He anticipates it almost, especially if I bounced it more than once. Somehow, my dog knows when I haven't fed it the full amount of food. Does your dog do this? Can your dogs relate? <laughs> Do you think the dog knows if the thing chasing it is faster or slower? There's an interesting one. Somehow a dog doesn't just run at one speed, right? It can speed up and slow down. What determines when it speeds up and slow down? Somehow there's a comparative analysis going on. But the dog doesn't even know the word math. Isn't that fascinating? Now, how about this? We see similar behavior in humans, right? So, like, when the wide receiver goes out in a football game to catch the ball, right, and the quarterback throws it 50 yards down the field and it lands right in their hands, unless they're on the Dallas Cowboys, in which case it was dropped. <laughs> sorry about that, sorry. But the gist of it is that somehow we know some things. Somehow there are some things that are just sort of known, just sort of understand. You might even call it pre-math, in a way. It's kind of interesting, it's math without math. Now, when we think of a data scientist, generally speaking, it evokes sort of images of like chalkboards and the ties and those lab coats. When you think data scientist, this is generally speaking what we think, right? We don't necessarily think about our dogs as data scientists. But what is data, if not information? It's just simply information, right? And what is a scientist but somebody that, through a series of experiences or history, creates a hypothesis, tests it, and then reacts. So what I'm saying is, I think we all do this. I think this is learning in general. I don't think this is a specific scientific process or anything. I think that we're all constantly learning, constantly growing, constantly testing. And it's not necessarily on that mathematic conscious level. It's actually quite human to think of a theory, to theorize on something, and then to sort of test it and, and realize uh, good or bad outcomes. Here's what I mean. Do you ever know when you're in a bad neighborhood, but you never pass a bad neighborhood sign, right? There's no signs like, welcome to bad neighborhood, population, you. You know what I mean? Like, it just doesn't happen. Um, but somehow you know when you're in a bad neighborhood, right? How about this? You ever drive, like you're driving on the highway, or you come across an intersection, and you slow down cautiously because you know it's dangerous? There's no report, there's no mathematics, there's nothing specifically saying that's really dangerous. How about this one? You can walk into an office area, you can walk into like a retail store, and you will infer, or you can walk into a restaurant, this is a really good one, and you will infer the quality of service, the quality of the food, the level of people, and specifically the morale, based on trash laying around the area. So without even meeting the people, you can have an opinion of the morale of the people working there. Fascinating, you know some things. You know some things without knowing these things. Now, this really blows my mind when I think about it, because where do we learn these things other than through this sort of trial, test, and experimentation and an adaptation? Just like the way the dog always catches the ball and does better with it over time. In fact, if you were to switch out your balls, as you, switch, as you uh, throw them to the dog, you would find that each time it has a new, new ball, they have to react slightly differently as they adapt and learn. Same thing as humans are doing. Now, why does this work? Where, where, how did this come to be? So, this is where it gets kind of interesting, sort of how the, uh, the, the place in your mind where you start like, making these decisions, because we've already said it's almost, in a way, pre-conscious. Now, there are a couple of reasons it works this way. There's a couple of reasons. Really, the reason the mind, whether it's the dog or ours, or a Dallas Cowboys football player, the reason we're able to make these sort of decisions is it's survival. We need to be able to, without a full set of information, react appropriately and do something about it. Because sometimes you don't have the full d data set. So there's a couple of ways this works. The first is gestalt theory, and, this, and the idea is that the mind, like I said, completes an incomplete data set. So here we see a triangle where no triangle was ever drawn by a human hand, or a dog hand for that matter. Dog paw. Uh, and and if, it, it can get more complex where you see things like a cube, but again, no cube really exists. But the mind is able to put these things together. Now, if you want to trick things, if you want to actually trick this sort of kicking off of this survival-like thinking, this pre-math thinking, these decisions ahead of time, you can actually trick the mind into it. 
To do so, you have to have context, that is, you have to be in the situation, and you have to remove the luxury of patience of thought or the ability to kind of get there logically. What I'm saying is you have to be able to react like that and imagine yourself in the situation. But I think that perhaps I've done a little bit too much telling you what you know already. I'm going to let you prove and you tell you what you know. So to that end, I want to perform a little test here. Bear with me, if you will. We're going to look at a couple of things, and I want your opinion. First off, which one of these roads would cause you to slow down? <laughs> Raise your hand if it's on the left or the right. Right? Okay. Now, what's interesting about that is they curve the same way, they look the same way, they may have the same topological geography, even the fauna looks the same, but we're all making the same decision based on that. Nobody got the traffic safety report in this room. Here's another interesting one. Which one of these people would you hire as a lawyer? <laughs> and you see, it's funny, I say lawyer because if I were to say, like, how do you think that person feels, you might give it some thought and say, well, maybe that one's just really busy. But when I say, well, it's your money, you only have one lawyer, and you're going to go to prison if you get it wrong, suddenly everyone has the same answer on that one. <laughs> you see what I mean? You know some things. Now, let me show you something really interesting. This is where I really, I'm fascinated by this. Please. Look at these eyes. Raise your hand when I say how that person is feeling. This is a person you've never met before, a total stranger to you. Are they feeling dominant, guilty, friendly, or horrified? Shocking. 100% of the audience just got the correct answer. You've never met this person, and all you see is their eyes. How did you know how that person feels without seeing it? I'm going to argue that you know some things. This is a very interesting concept, and especially when we can trick our brains into getting there. Now, here's why I bring this all up. This is my point here in telling you this. There's a gentleman named, by the name of Peter Drucker, and he once said that what gets measured gets managed. And it's really true if you think about it. Like, as soon as it's on the scorecard, it sort of becomes the focus of the thing that gets managed to a certain way. And it kind of makes sense because now it's in front of us. This is our, our thing in front of us. And it becomes tactile once you put a measurement around it. I interpret this statement slightly differently. I interpret this about responsibility. Now, responsibility to me is a fascinating word. I absolutely love this word. Because if you break down the word, you have response, able. What I'm getting at is the ability to respond makes you response-able, which made you responsible. So in a way, once you've started measuring something or once you've brought it to your conscious out of that subconscious decisioning level, you became, con you became responsible for it. So here's what I'm arguing. Perhaps the world's most dangerous intersections wouldn't be so if we all knew they were the most dangerous intersections. Perhaps Perhaps we could actually affect morale in our office place by inspiring people and picking up the trash around us. Perhaps we can do better in our relationships and not have to ask what's wrong ten times, and we could get it down to seven or so, if we understood that we know some things. And what I'm saying is I think that if we move just a little bit of these things we know, if we say, I think I do know that, I think I do know when someone's in trouble, I think I do know how these things work, and we don't make it a rational or a conscious or a logical decision. Again, I'm a data person arguing for speed of decision and no reports. <laughs> if we move it up right away and say, I do know this thing, I am aware of this stuff, perhaps, just perhaps, we can fix these things and make the world a better place. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Luke Horgan, and I'm a data scientist, and I think maybe, just maybe, you are too. Thank you very much.